Chefs Without Restaurants, episode 46, with Jason and Mike from the International Sous Vide Association. I, of course, got one of Jason's books, just random off Amazon and and um, got into his Facebook group. And then I'm an event planner. That's my background, uh, doing conferences and seminars. And um, after being a part of his group, I started, you know, realizing like there's, I think at the time there were like 27,000 people or something in the group. And I'm like, you know, wouldn't it be fun if we could all get together and, and cook? Like this is, this this would just be great to explore this. And I was kind of in between things at the time. So I reached out to Jason randomly on Facebook and was like, hey, I have this idea. Have you ever seen this? You know, has, has anybody done this? I haven't seen a sous vide conference. I haven't seen a sous vide association. Is this a thing? Yeah, I was just like, is this guy like scamming me or something? Like, is this just one of those random emails you get you know, out of the blue? This is the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast with your host, Chris Spear. Each week, I'll be speaking with food entrepreneurs and people in the culinary industry. If you're interested in learning more about our organization dedicated to helping people build and grow their food businesses, look us up on the web at chefswithoutrestaurants.com and .org, and on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Chefs Without Restaurants. Now, enjoy the show. On this episode, we have Jason and Mike from the International Sous Vide Association. We discuss Sous Vide Basics, how their organization was started, and their upcoming Sous Vide Conference. I put a lot of links in the show notes so you can find their organization online, as well as information on the conference and many of their presenters, so please check them out. If you want to support the show, our Venmo name is C-H-E-F-W-O-R-E-S. T-O-S. Thanks so much and have a great weekend. All right. Welcome, everyone. This is Chris with the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast. And today I have two guests. I have Jason and Mike from the International Sous Vide Association. Hey, guys, how are you doing? Doing really good. Yeah, doing awesome. Thanks for having us, Chris. Oh, thanks for coming on. Yeah. So I guess I met Jason probably about three, four years ago, maybe at uh, Star Chefs for their Chefs Congress, which Jason and I ended up in almost every single <laughs> workshop together. I think every year, like we didn't plan it that way. Yep. We just somehow ended up in the same ones. And interestingly, I think I told him maybe last year, my old sous chef actually had bought uh, one of his cookbooks. Like I didn't know anything about you, but he had just got into sous vide and was looking for some books and found one of your books on Amazon and, and bought it. And, you know, then like five years later, I ended up meeting you in person, which I thought was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely fun that we kept at, ended up in not only the same workshops, but like the same tables half the time. Like, hey, I remember you. And that was fun. Yeah, definitely. So that's how this started. And then um, last year was your last year was the first year of the conference, right? Yep. Yeah. So I got to go to that up in Delaware. And that was a really good time. So why don't we kind of start at the beginning? How did this whole sous vide association start? Who started it? Did you guys know each other? Like, what's your relationship to each other? So apparently Jason meets all the best people in his life because they bought his books first because that's what happened here. Um, I, I got into sous vide cooking in 2014. My mother-in-law bought me a sans hair, um, which to my wife's chagrin, I still tell her is the best physical gift outside of, you know, children that anybody's ever given me. <laughs> um, but I, of course, you know, got one of Jason's books just random off Amazon and, and, I think I bought about 15 of that book for like friends and family now because it helped me so much. Um, got into his Facebook group and then uh, I'm an event planner. That's my background uh, doing conferences and seminars. And um, after being a part of his group, um, you know, I, I just have this thing about building connections with people and wanting, I started, you know, realizing like there's, I think at the time there were like 27,000 people or something in the group. And I'm like, you know, wouldn't it be fun if we could all get together and, and cook? Like, this is this this would just be great to explore this. Um, and I was kind of in between things at the time. So I reached out to Jason randomly on Facebook and was like, hey, I have this idea. Have you ever seen this? Uh, you know, has, has anybody done this? I haven't seen a sous vide conference. I haven't seen a sous vide association. Is this a thing? Um, and then, you know, it just turned into magic. I'll let you tell the, the next part of that. <laughs> Yeah, I was just like, is this guy like scamming me or something? Like, is this just one of those random emails you get, you know, out of the blue? And 
as we get, you know, kept getting further and further in the plans and it's really started coming together and got some really big names to come on board. Um, the first time, you know, Korea and cuisine solutions was our title sponsor, uh, Dave Petransic from PolyScience. another, uh, met him at star chefs as well. He's always there. Um, so we got some big support and the whole conference just kind of came together and I was like, apparently this is a real thing that is now actually happening. And, you know, had it last year, the, the first one, and it was, an amazing time with lots of good food, lots of good speakers and a lot of, a lot of good fun. Well, Jason, how did you get into sous vide and how long have you been doing that? So about 10 years ago now for Christmas, I got a copy of Thomas Keller's under pressure cookbook and a, the old sous vide crock pot temperature controller that you'd plug the crock pot in and it basically turn it on or off to maintain temperature. And I read through Under Pressure from cover to cover, and I was like, I still have no idea what he's really saying here. And part of that's because, you know, he was still learning, I think, sous vide a lot, especially the underlying principles of it himself. But it's also Thomas Keller. You know, his recipe for roasting a chicken is like eight pages. It's, you know, it's three-star Michelin quality things he's explaining to you. And I'm a home cook and just an adventurous home cook. So I didn't really understand what he was getting at at a lot of it. So I said, you know what, I'm going to do the research and figure out what, how do you actually use sous vide and what is it all about? And at the time, there was no information really. It was all on eGullet with Nathan Miragold and Douglas Baldwin before they were household names for a lot of people, um, before Modernist Cuisine, you know, box set came out. And they were just on eGullet posting in the forums. And as I dove into it, I realized that for the most part, there was a lot of science like sciencey people doing science to figure out what was happening and then communicating to other sciencey people. And that's completely fine. And that's a good way to learn about something when they're discovering a technique, but that's not what a lot of cooks need. You know, when you roast a chicken, you don't need to understand the temperature diffusion and thermal depth curves, even though they happen in roasting a chicken, just like they do a sous vide. You just need to know what temperature you want the meat to be. And, you know, that cooking it at 500 will give you a different result than cooking at 350 and kind of understanding a little bit of that, but you don't need to know the hard science behind it. So once I stripped away all the hard kind of science behind the sous vide, I was left with some principles that are very easy to understand and make sous vide super easy and super convenient. So I started sharing those on my blog and that turned into cookbooks and, um, just the rest is history. 10 years later, you know, Facebook group of 40,000 people and sold tens of thousands of books and still just an adventurous home cook. But I, you know, get to share my love for sous vide with a lot of people now. I don't know how you get a Facebook group that big. That seems crazy. I don't think I'm in any Facebook groups that big, except, um, you know, like one or two. Uh, how do you control that? Are you, how many moderators do you have? Do you have multiple moderators? Does the, I'm assuming at that number, like people just pretty much self police and answer questions. Like one person comes on, asks a question and everyone else does the work. Yeah, that's pretty much how it is. The, we really don't have moderators. Like I, I will ban people if they act out. My mom is another moderator on there, you know, but that's about it. Mike does, you know, alerts me whenever people are misbehaving, but it's really, if someone crosses the line and our lines pretty much like you don't treat people like garbage <laughs> then if you cross that line you're out of the group and blocked there's no engagement from me there's no kind of dealing with these people it's just you're banned from the group and people know that so they generally behave the majority of the time yeah it's hard as you know i have the chefs without restaurants facebook group and we're approaching like a thousand people and that gets to be a lot um, cause I have no one else moderating, doing anything and people post things and you just kind of hope that like members within the group can answer each other's questions. And it's, you know, a little hands off for me and I don't have to do that cause there's a lot going on elsewhere, but I'm just always impressed at these huge groups and <laughs> that's still a, a incredibly large number for me to wrap my head around. Uh, when yeah. did the group start? It started about three or four years ago. And, and honestly, I've just been really lucky that the people in the group are a great community. And there's a lot of people that are very visible within the group that help kind of steer it and answer a lot of questions. And it's, it's really less about me, the group, and about, it's more about all the great community members that we have there. Well, that's what I was helping, hoping with my chef's group is that like you can kind of crowdsource all this stuff, right? Like if you have a lot of great members and great engagement that 
it's a community that can kind of help each other out, uplift each other. And you just need a very little amount of kind of direction for it. Yep. I think it's all about kind of setting the tone that you want the group to have. And in my case, that was helpful and friendly. And then as long as you enforce that, the people that like that tone will be more involved and they'll continue to propagate that tone. So do you have any idea what the makeup of your general crowd is, whether it be people in the group or people who come to the convention, like home cooks, serious enthusiasts versus like professional chefs? I think it's about 60 to 70% home cooks. And I think about the same for the conference. Is that right, Mike? Yeah, it's it's right around, I think, 60% home cooks, 40% uh, uh, professionals for the conference. And that's something were, we've been... As, I was just going to say, that's something we've been looking to, you know, expand on, especially going into this year's conference was, you know, Mike and I are both home cooks. So we didn't want to come out and say like, we're going to teach you how to use sous vide in your restaurant. Cause we don't know that we focus on what we know. Uh, but now we do have a lot of great partners like Korea and poly science and backmaster and Vesta, a lot of these brands that do work with people in a professional kitchen. So we're looking at expanding that to really provide some of these services to chefs that, either one who, you know, that are chefs that want to learn how to use it in their own kitchen or that are cooks that are trying to move their way up through other people's kitchens and, you know, just add one more tool to their toolbox. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was really impressed with the makeup of home cooks that were there who seem super knowledgeable. I mean, I think sometimes you hear like home cook and there's this idea of like who a home cook is. There's home cooks killing it in all levels of food. I mean, one of my guests on the podcast is my buddy, Uh, Anthony, who does pasta at home, and he's making pasta better than almost any restaurant I've ever been to, you know, and he doesn't work in the food field at all, but he's like gone all in. And I saw that just with um, a lot of the interactions with the people at the conference and the questions they were asking. You know, it's interesting. I was talking with uh, with one of our commercial company sponsors recently, and we were were talking about this and um, home cooks have I think a little bit more of a license to be creative almost like they, they are more, they have more flexibility to push themselves to try new techniques because they're not preparing it for service every night for 300 people, you know? Um, And, and I think that's something that I've seen in the groups. Um, I mean, it's interesting what direction that goes because uh, the other thing is, I mean, you see some people doing some really cool things outside of meat, but then there's a whole portion that's like, Oh, sous vide is for steak and you know chicken, and that's it. Um, but but in general, I think there's there's on the home cook side, what they have going for them is there's just this uh, opportunity to just try things, and if you fail, hey, you, you know, tick off your wife, and she's like, oh, I still love you, but you know, it wasn't the best one you've ever done. Um, at least that's what mine says most of the time. <laughs> Do you think it uh, kind of is because it idiot proofs things to some extent, like, you know, roasting a chicken or cooking a steak is very, you know, you got to watch it and get it out at the right time where sous vide is kind of like set it, forget it, because you're not going to go over that number. Do you think that that weighs into it a little bit that it can kind of help you if you're not a professional cook and aren't really um, in tune with that kind of stuff? Definitely. I mean, for, for me, and Jason probably has a lot more on this, but for me personally, when I got into it, um, it opened up the opportunities for me to try things like an eggs Benedict and make a hollandaise sauce because now I'm not worried about my eggs, you know, overcooking because they're going to cook for 45 minutes or whatever. Um, I can focus and, and Jason's probably seen from where, where I started posting to kind of what I post now. Um, I'm a lot more, I've always loved cooking, but I'm a lot more willing to take risks and try new techniques, half of which I learned from him. Um, because it takes sort of the, the, you know, Hey, I'm going to screw this up if I don't watch it super closely out of it. Yeah. In my opinion, there's like sous vide has two purposes. One is to turn out these types of dishes that you can really only do with sous vide, like a 72 hour short rib or some of these things that are, you can use traditional methods to do it, but you're really just using traditional methods to, you know, emulate sous vide, these low, long, slow cooks. And the other purpose of sous vide is to just make things super convenient. And that's where a lot of home cooks, like you're saying, really benefit from it. That cooking a chicken breast is, yeah, I can do that almost perfectly every time that I want to do it. But I have to be at the stove and be paying attention and not be answering my email or, you know, on Slack or, you know, all these other distractions going on. And so 
knowing with sous vide, those can be perfectly cooked at the end. It just removes any concern for me. And I think a lot of home cooks have found that and that kind of gives them the license to, you know, now I'm going to do a sauce because I know the proteins going to be cooked perfectly. So they can kind of explore in a few different directions that they might be worried about the, the protein if they were just going to grill it or pan fry it. My favorite thing to do is uh, ice cream because I love making ice cream. And that's one of those things like from it's not thick to scrambled eggs is like a 15 second window, right? Like if you're ever making a custard ice cream over a, a bain marie, it goes so quickly, much like a hollandaise. So that's one of those things I love doing my ice cream base. I mean, there's obviously so many great um, uses for sous vide. But for me, that's one of my very favorites is just put the mix in there, throw it in and let it go. Yeah. yeah, I think the convenience is a huge factor. And I think especially, I think it's becoming more accepted now just as a general technique. But I think initially a lot of chefs were like, this isn't real cooking or, you know, I can already do this using another method. And some of the real strong sous vide supporters would be like, well, it's better if you do this or it's like, and you get an argument. For me, there's always just, it's another tool in your toolbox. Yeah. And sometimes you might want to just make it the, the traditional way because of the sights and the sounds and the smells, because you're really enjoying it in that moment. And sometimes you might just want to put together a really quick ice cream base and not worry about it. And when that's the case, you sous vide and you know, it's just one more tool out of all the tools we have as chefs. And I don't think it's better or worse than any other, you know, technique that you can use. I also think it, as a home cook, I think it brings, you know, as a chef, like you're used to cooking for massive groups of people, you know, all the time. And um, I love entertaining. That That's one of the things that's been hardest for me about quarantine with all of this going on is I can't have, you know, my friends over and, and, and cook for people. My wife's a resident at Johns Hopkins and every summer, uh, which this is probably the first year we're not going to do it, we've done a welcome barbecue or, or a welcome, you know, thing at our house for 20 to 40 new residents and, and we invite everybody. And it makes it so nice to be able to like batch cook everything, have it prepped in advance, you know, using sous vide and pasteurized. Um, and it makes it like I can actually go hang out with my wife and hang out with the guests. And um, there's just a lot to the community building aspect of it that I think has resonated really strongly with me. I'm always wondering why people love crock pot cooking. Like to me, crock pot cooking is like the same idea, but in like a less controlled environment and a lot more unsafe. Like I always think about my in-laws. I went to their house one time for a party and they'd just taken this bag of like meatballs out of the freezer from Costco and just jammed them all in this crock pot. And it probably sat in the temperature danger zone for hours. When you think of like something that was like zero degrees and like four hours later, it's probably like 72 degrees. It's like, oh, I wish more people would do sous vide because I feel like you'd get a much better result because that's what you're doing, right? Like all these people want to do it, like set it, forget it, slow and low, and then make entertaining easy. And I'd rather see people get a, a sous vide setup than using that crock pot for that. Well, it's great because you don't come out with, you know, 180 degree shredded chicken at the end of it. Um, you know, we, we, I mean, crock pot, I, I used to use it a lot before I got into sous vide because it was convenient, but uh, I, I'm with you right there. Like, why, why would I even go that route when the end result is always going to be a well done braised meat? I can, you know, do the same thing and get something that uh, is a little more palatable. For sure. I mean, obviously, cost is a barrier to entry and something. I'm sure people are looking at, you know, a $30 crock pot as opposed to like a multi hundred dollar piece of uh, equipment and then getting into the whole what are we doing about vacuum sealing and all that. So it is an investment. And, um, you know, what are you guys seeing on pricing with that? Is is it coming down? I mean, I know some of the things I've been looking at have come down over time, but where are we at with like price ranges on those? Yeah, prices have dropped a whole lot. It's um, There's two real classes of circulators um, to do sous vide. One is the professional ones and the others for home units. And if a chef out there is interested in exploring sous vide, like get yourself a home unit, do some things in your off time and experiment with it. So you can get, um, even sticking with the good brands like Anova and Juul, you can get something now for under $100. So you can, you know, it's not that much of an investment. It's the cost of, you know, not even a good knife, really. And you can explore this cooking method. And then when you're ready to bring it into a professional kitchen, you can look at some of the more commercial circulators. And those are 600 to 1,000. So it is more, but it's, you know, I still use a polyscience unit that I got 10 years ago. And 
you know, they're built to run for years without with literally not ever being turned off. So you kind of get that heavy duty industrial quality that you need for a, for a working restaurant kitchen. Is that what the heavy duty upgrade does really is like motor life and things like that? I mean, do, do the home units have a limitation on how much water they can heat or some like volume size? Is that? Yeah. The, the main things that the commercial ones give you is, you know, heating power that you can do a lot larger amount. So you might do a bath to cook, you know, a hundred steaks where most home cooks don't need that. And then just the, the durability, a lot of the home units are good for people that are, you know, using them a few times a week and they're last for a few years, like most things you use at home. But if you're, you know, using them 24 hours a day, seven days a week in a professional kitchen where they're getting bumped and spilled on and, you know, abused, then you really, the commercial upgrade is really kind of what they, you need. Cause otherwise the other ones will break sooner rather than later. And then some of the ones um, have probes and more, um, some of the better functionality that some, some chefs do need in their kitchens. So that's one of the other things that most home units don't have. Yeah. I always recommend if you can afford to buy something and you think you're going to love it, go with the upgrade at the front end. Cause it always sucks when you spend like a hundred, two hundred $200 on that home model. And then like in a year you really love it. And then you're dropping like another six, $800 It's like, you should just put that money towards that. <laughs> but we've all been there. I've done that with like the recording stuff for my podcast. You buy a cheap microphone for $30 and then you're buying the hundred dollar microphone in two months when you realize the audio quality was terrible. Right. Yep. So let's talk about the conference a little bit. So you had a big conference scheduled to be a normal conference in person uh, in San Francisco this summer. COVID happens, so that's not happening. Um, but you're going to take your conference virtual. So what's that look like for you guys? What's changed? And um, what do you? how do you think that's going to go? So um, the, one of the, the awesome things is all of our speakers pretty much have confirmed that they're still doing, they're still going to present virtually. Um, so in terms of the content, uh, not much is changing in terms of, you know, what we're presenting. Um, the, the format will change slightly. Um, certainly one of the great things last year was we had some awesome meat sponsors that donated, you know, for the receptions and Cuisine Solutions put on uh, one of them. And so the food was incredible. So a lot of our thought process is, okay, how do we still um, capture that, you know, capture the, the food portion? And how do we make it engaging? Because certainly a lot of why I wanted to even do this in the first place was to network with people, to, to get to know people, to make new friends in the industry um, or, you know, other home cooks that we can kind of share with. So um, talking about doing a lot of like, uh, certainly some hands-on demos. Uh, one example, we talked about for both of the lunches, having a couple different or, or a few different rooms each day where we would give the recipes in advance, tell people, you know, hey, if you want to cook this chicken dish, have a chicken breast cooked 140 for three hours and ready. And then here's all the other ingredients. And, you know, Jason's going to be cooking this dish and he'll demonstrate it live. You can cook along um, so some cook along stuff like that, that I think will be really fun. Um, still doing virtual cocktail hours to, you know, demonstrate some cocktails, but also just hang out. That was another really fun thing. I think for us to see last year was, um, the bar every night was packed with attendees and speakers together, like just hanging out and networking. I'm sure you, um, caught a little bit of that when you were there. And so a lot of our speakers are still very engaged in being a part of those networking opportunities and, you know, getting connected with the attendees who are coming. So that's um, looking at things a little bit different, um, but really trying to hit on the same goals and the same things that made last year so special. Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to see this for a little while, but, you know, it's, I don't think a online conference can ever replace the feel of being in person. But like yeah. we had said before this started, this year I was not going to be able to make the trip to San Francisco. Yeah. Um, this is so much more convenient for me. So it'll be interesting to see the swing in attendees and people who maybe couldn't spend the money to hop on a plane and fly out to one of the most expensive cities in the country and yeah. put up the lodging and pay for that, that they will come online. So I'll be yeah. interested in following up with you guys afterwards to see how that went, um, you know, There's how your attendees liked it. and For sure. There's definitely some some opportunities like that, that 
I think for growing the audience, that's great that we can we can put this in the hands of more people. We had talked about live streaming last year, but being the first year, we didn't want too many moving parts. So really, this is kind of a kickstart for us to you know test out the technology and hopefully going forward, we'll be able to, to still offer a live stream package as well for the people that can't, you know, make it out for various reasons. So um, I, all in all, I'm excited about the possibilities that this offers us. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's just going to be an awesome weekend. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Are you going to make them available after the fact, kind of like on demand and being able to download or stream whenever? Yeah. Yeah. So. Anyone that any, sorry, <laughs> anyone no, that comes it. to the uh, anyone that comes to the conference uh, virtually will have access for for all the recordings for I think it was seventy two hours or a week something like that. Yep. Um, Mike's in charge of the details. You know, I'm just the pretty <laughs> face that. Uh, um, oh gosh, So they'll have access trouble. to it for uh, <laughs> a long time that they can go through it at their own leisure, and then we will make them available for purchase to the general public. Um, at some point in the future, once we kind of clean them up and uh, package them together. So we have a new online community uh, called Champions of Sous Vide, uh, named after our, our cookbook. That's kind of sort of our, our new little moniker that we started. Um, and it's it, there's a free membership level, and then there's sort of a VIP level that gives you a little more access. And um, the recordings will be available uh, automatically for the VIPs, but then available for purchase outside of that as well. And, uh, you know, really trying to just continue to build that community aspect of cooking and be able to share recipes in one place. Uh, in, a, in a way, Facebook's kind of hard to catalog some of that stuff. And, and there's just a lot of things that we're trying to bring into this, this new community to sort of pull together everything that we're, we're working on into one place. So who are some of your speakers for this event? So uh, our two keynotes were super excited. James Brissione, who was uh, planning to be there last year, and then oh, so horribly sad for him and for us that his flights got canceled. Um, but he just, uh, he's, of course, Food Network personality, and he uh, opened a new restaurant in Pensacola that I've been to. It is fantastic, called the Angelinas. Uh, Rich Rosendale, certified master chef, is going to be our other keynote. Super excited to have him. Um, Meathead will be back uh, doing a session, Gerard and AJ from Cray and Cuisine Solutions. Uh, we have a new title sponsor uh, for the virtual, it's uh, Preparate uh, by Everage. And so Michael Kelly will be there. He does a lot of teaching um, in the industry. Of course, Dave Petransic, uh, Philip Preston is also going to come and, and do a talk. Um, and Ali Romero. Ali Romero. Yep, there you go. Um, super excited. So, you know, we have a lot of returning people, but then we also have a lot of new, new folks like Ali who, uh, we were just introduced to, and we're really excited to be able to, to bring them together as well. And I find that most of those people I know, and they're already really engaging online, which is what I love. I mean, they're the kind of people who I followed on Twitter. I mean, I think James, I first met probably close to like 10 years ago on Twitter, you know, one of those guys who you could just ask questions and have really great conversations with. So it seems like you've gotten the people who really want to be part of that community. I'm sure there'll be a lot of follow up after the conference with them online. Yeah, we're doing some uh, live Q and A's leading up to the event, which should be fun. I did one with Dave Petranzik uh, last week, I think. And then we're doing one or two a week leading up to the event to kind of get them some time in front of our community and let our community, you know, pick their, uh, their brain some. And it's, it's, that was one of my big takeaways from the event last year was just how nice a lot of these people are that, you know, Dave Petranzik works for the largest sous vide manufacturer. Gerard and AJ, you know, consult at three star Michelin restaurants and know more about sous vide than probably anyone on earth. And they're all like down to earth, really nice people that are just happy to, you know, just, shoot the breeze with you and hang out and have a good time. And it was really refreshing to meet these really talented people that are just so nice. I've gotten to know Rich Rosendale really well. So I have the benefit. His place is like half an hour from where I live yep. um, and the best barbecue around. Like I, you can fake a lot of barbecue shoulder and stuff like that, but brisket is one of those things. And his brisket is unlike any that I can get around here. But you know, it always surprises me. This guy is a, certified master chef. I mean, he's got, you know, all these accolades, Boku store and all that. Yeah. And he's in his place. Maybe it's just when I go, but like literally every time I go in, you know, you can just yeah. stop in on a Tuesday at three and Rich is there. And it's like, I don't even think people in this area know who he is. 
and understand how big a deal that is that you just like stop in this like roadside barbecue place and this you know the guy who led the culinary team and is a master chef is like in there and i can just roll in and have a conversation with him um yeah so it blows my mind i i went down to meet him and i learned don't ever go meet him on a monday because his restaurant is closed on mondays Um, sadly sadly i've driven out there forgetting that as well i i learned that lesson but he's just the and with a lot of these people and like you're saying i mean he's so accomplished um and he's done so much and he's a he's a name that so many people know he's the most down-to-earth guy ever you can just sit and have a conversation super friendly um just really have enjoyed getting to know him and and uh you know we're we're really lucky i think that was sort of the the turning point for me and i think jason would probably agree with this too when we first started this thing our initial um our initial focus was like hey let's go connect with people in the industry most of whom jason knew because i'm an event planner um, and let's pitch this idea and let's just bring some people together onto a committee to sort of help form this because this is not about me and Jason. This is about the sous vide community um, and getting people like James and Dave who, I mean, gosh, Dave's traveling all the time. Maybe not right now, but, you know, he's at the biggest food shows ever. He's in Milan, Italy and, and all this. And he's like, you know, I have no time, but I'm going to make time for this because I think this is important seeing the people step up to to that said hey yeah i want to be a part of this was was really the first moment i was like you know this is this is something that's going to be good this is something that that the community needs that people are going to be behind and um i just feel really really lucky to have been sort of at the onset of it and i'm i'm so excited to see kind of where it goes over the next few years yeah i've got to get dave on the show he and i have been going back and forth about schedule and it's like, you're sitting at home now, Dave. What are you going to do? <laughs> and then Rich, the same thing, because he's got this build out of this new place he's been working on. Yeah. Um, but hopefully those are two guys. Maybe I can get them on the show before your conference and get a little extra plug in there. But they awesome. Give them a little poke in the ribs. Yeah. To- a, little, exactly. a little poke. But yeah, I mean, the same with Dave. I mean, Dave and I have had a couple phone conversations. I mean, I think one was like an hour and a half one day. And, yeah. um, you know, more than willing to share his knowledge on things. So... Yep. Yeah, great guess. I love the idea of community building. It's the same with, you know, my chefs without restaurants. I literally thought when I started it, it was going to be like four people I knew and we we're going to have like this little group of independent chefs. And now yeah. looking back at a community where we have literally thousands of people across all platforms with different level in, of engagement and then a podcast where people are asking me to come on the show. And I feel like, you know, I'm punching above my weight class. Like, wow, this, you know, really well-known person wants to come on my show. It's kind of cool that I get to now sit down and interview people who I admire. Um, because again, I thought it was just going to be like my friends in Frederick who have a catering company who I'd have on the show. And especially now with the Zoom, uh, it's so much easier to be able to then just reach out to people anywhere in the world and have them sit down for this. I can relate to that. When I first reached out to Jason, I'm like, okay, this dude's a celebrity. He's like a sous vide celebrity. And yes, you are. Uh, he, <laughs> he, he, he doesn't say it, but uh, he certainly felt like one uh, until I got to know him more. But, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's amazing to see food is just a great unifier. Like if, if there's one thing our world needs right now, it's this. It's getting together, eating good meals, stuffing our mouths so we can't talk to each other and just, you know, coming together and, and being together, you know. And I think I think there's a lot of good movements that are kind of putting that together. But the more of these little niche communities that we can bring together and, and support each other, I mean, that's what's going to make a difference in everything that's going on right now. And I do think having, like you said, a niche community where, you know, I think sometimes you see these things and they're way too broad, but you, I mean, you guys narrowed in on sous vide, something super specific. And it sounds like you have a lot of people in your community. Where, yeah, it's yeah. it's amazing how many people can be in a you know quote unquote small niche community. That there's a lot of passionate people out there about a lot of obscure things, and you can build a really good following just with the focusing on something that you really enjoy doing. So, are you two the only ones kind of doing all the legwork on all of this, or do you have a team? So last year it was it was mostly just the two of us with a lot of. I would say as far as like doing the work, building the the conference, um, it certainly like Dave was instrumental last year. And of course has been helpful this year with a lot of things, but um, he made the connections with Craya, the, you know, so many 
um, and several of our other sponsors. That's how we got introduced to Rich and, and several of these other people. This year, uh, we're really lucky to have had a few people uh, who really had a great time at the conference and were like, you know, I want to get more involved, want to help. Um, so Lennis Perez and Lisa Keys uh, are, are two bloggers that are, I don't know if Lennis is, if she'd call herself a blogger, but um, she was one of our MCs last year and, and did a session talk. So they're kind of heading up the marketing front. They're helping to interview some of the speakers ahead of time and, you know, just do a lot of work on putting the marketing plan together because that is certainly not my background. And Jason and I have a lot of other stuff. And then uh, Seth is is another person that we met last year who uh, really was like, I've known Seth for a while, but yeah, I've yeah, known Seth. Seth was in Boy Scouts with me uh, thirty oh, years Scouts? ago. How so. did I not know this? Yeah, my earliest memories of Seth are I. I have to just share this because he would be mortified. Um, it's <laughs> when we were in Boy Scouts and him being so homesick and crying as he was two years younger than us and just going, "Oh, this kid is such." Such a weenie, and now thirty years later, we're uh, still really good friends and working together. I'm so <laughs> yeah. out of out of my league here. I was going to say, which one of you guys ended up in the military? Uh, uh, Seth did. Yeah, the, the weenie, yeah. the one that was yeah. crying. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, he's he's awesome. And to be perfectly honest, I went to one session at the conference last year because I was so busy at my own stinking conference. I got to see one one talk, and Seth had noticed and was like, "Look." I really enjoyed this. I enjoyed, he was helping Jason uh, out in the booth and then he kind of helped with some of the other stuff. And he's like, I actually really enjoyed this. I'd love to help out on the logistics side. So he's gotten really involved in kind of helping to, to run all of that. And, and, you know, when we were doing the in-person thing, uh, get involved with the hotel. So um, both of those, um, both of those sort of subcommittees within our, our general committee, uh, they've been just instrumental. And certainly, um, you know, we just did the recipe contest. We've had uh, a lot of people, a lot of our committee members volunteer to judge for that and, and go through. So it's a team effort for sure. I mean, it's a, it's a lot, it's a, a lot of stuff and, uh, you know, we're grateful for everybody that's kind of come to support it and, and help out. Got to start somewhere. I mean, you could have a star chef size conference at some point, right? We'll I mean, see. last year, I mean, it felt big last year. I mean, you had multiple rooms, multiple things going on at the same time. You had your little area out front where people could look at things and uh, try some food. So, I mean, it already felt like a big conference for year one, in my opinion, because I've been to a lot of uh, smaller conferences. Yeah. Yeah. We were pleased with the feel that we had about uh, 140, 150 people there. And it was a good amount that it felt that there was a lot of people, but it didn't feel overwhelming you know and especially at the receptions and with the food it, everyone could really mingle and talk with everyone and all the speakers came out to the receptions and so you could you know hang out with all these big names that were there and they were happy to have a drink and you know hang out and chat which was gave it a really good intimate feeling to it yeah i don't want to get to the point where our numbers are so big that it feels like a, a trade show you know that that's not what we're in this for um and, and so i think Certainly, we want to grow. We have we have great aspirations for where this is going to go. But our focus in all of that is okay. How do we do it measurably? How do we make sure we don't lose? Because I I've done a lot of conferences and and seminars, and they're really I'm not saying this because it was our thing. There there was just something special in the community last year that that I felt, and I think a lot of other people shared that they felt as well. And I don't want to lose that. So you know we're we're doing a lot to figure out how do we promote that? How do we keep that? And how do we, you know, grow without losing it? I always find when I go to those things, I have as much fun and learn as much from the other attendees as the people yeah. presenting, right? Because you're all there for the same thing. You all have the same passion. And I'm sure you have a lot of people who made friends with each other. Actually, there's a lot of people that I became friends with who I've kept in contact with yeah. uh, after that from last year. So that was really cool. And uh, some of them, we talk a lot uh, on Instagram now. One of my friends that I went to culinary school with traveled from Puerto Rico to come to your conference, which was insane because I hadn't seen him in, well, since we graduated in like 98. Yeah. And then he was randomly there. He's like, oh yeah, I'm really into this. He's got a restaurant in Puerto Rico. And I guess yep. his wife bought him, you know, tickets she for, was awesome. she for was whatever, an awesome. uh, anniversary <laughs> or something. But yeah. that, that seemed crazy to me, like huge, that he came up for that. And I was yeah. glad that I was able to catch up with him while he was in town. 
Yeah, and then he brought a friend of his who I think was the director of culinary for like Planet Hollywood in, in Dominican Republic or something. Um, yeah, he was great. And his wife was was so fun to deal with. Like she was wonderful. Um, that was a, she was so excited to surprise him with this, you know? And I mean, that's the, it's a, it's a big community, but it's really small at the same time. Like it, they're, there's a power in in building friendships with people, you know, and and I think that's why it's important to do these things outside of just, you know, sharing recipes online and whatnot. That's, that's, I think, what these bring to the table. Do you guys have anything else you want to talk about as far as sous vide, your conference or anything before I jump into a couple like closing rapid fire questions? I would just say um, we're doing, we just did a, our first recipe contest, which was sous vide comfort foods. And we announced the winners of that yesterday. Um, which we got about 30 entrants and uh, gave away a couple circulators and and had about, I think all 450, almost 500 people voted. Um, so we're doing another one that we we launched this morning that is uh, sous vide barbecue. Uh, Meathead's one of the judges on that. Next month is going to be sous vide cocktails. So uh, we're, we're pretty excited about those. If, if anybody has uh, recipes that they'd like to get out there and, and you know, try to win one of these, uh, these awards. We'd love to have submissions for that. And I would say if you're out there and listening and you're interested in sous vide, just give it a try. You can do some really interesting things with it. And it's just, it's just one more tool, you know, to make you a better chef and help you do what you want to do. It's not replacing anything necessarily. It's just teaching you one more thing that you can, you know, use to manipulate food in whatever way you want to, to get the desired result. So give it a try, you know, check out our stuff, send us questions, uh, watch our live Q and A's and you can, you know, shoot people like uh, David Transick and Michael Kelly an email and they will be more than happy to, you know, help get you started and give you some ideas on how you can use it in whatever type of flow your kitchen has. We have really comprehensive show notes, so there will be links to all of your website, social media, all that stuff, so everyone will be able to reach out and connect with you guys, and I share this everywhere. So, Awesome. awesome. Thanks, Chris. So other that. than yourselves and your, re- your resources that you have, I just kind of like to see what other people are into. So um, let's start. Do you guys have favorite chefs, one or two? I really... James Brisson has been someone I followed for a while. Um, I have the flavor matrix. I love what he does. Just, I, I'm a weird food guy. Like I love, I love just experimenting with stuff. Um, so he's certainly somebody that I've enjoyed um, following. Really, I followed a lot since since the summit last year, and I, I I followed a lot of food before, but not a lot on the pro side. And and I think I've been pretty impressed with a lot of people that we that, you know, joined us last year and, and followed out. But, but James is the one that I probably watched the most. I should probably follow more chefs, um, <laughs> but I, I tend to not have uh, enough time to consume as much uh, other food media because I'm busy writing my own recipes and doing stuff. Um, but I, I do follow, you know, the, the chefs that follow um, the ISVA and have done stuff with us, but how about resources? Do you have like websites that you love, cookbooks, like anything to point people in the direction again, other than yours, because you have a lot, but what are you looking at and what do you recommend people check out? I use a lot of the uh, poly science resources, especially for sous vide. They have some great videos and recipes and guides. Um, so I've really, I really like the stuff that Dave puts together there. Um, you know, I follow, it's not sous vide specific, but ideas and food is you know, they've been at it for 15, 20 years every day. I was really Um, surprised. Like they took, it looked like a month off not too long ago. And I was like, you guys were the ones you've blogged every single day for like 15 years. But I mean, you know, there's obviously a lot going on right now. I was surprised that they did it as long as they did. And now it's picked up. I mean, they're a couple of my very favorite people. And when you talk about people who are like open books, as far as sharing information, um, they have been amazing. And actually my first kind of like break in the professionalish industry, like with food media was they gave me credit for something on their website one day. And it was like the first time I had ever been mentioned in any food media. I mean, I'd been cooking professionally for like 20 plus years, but I felt like I finally made it when I got like a little credit 
on one of their blog posts that was one of their more popular ones at the time because I helped them with some recipe development and tried some things out. And they linked to my website. And it was the first bump where I got a lot of traffic to my website. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I push everybody to Jason's website. And I don't say that because he's my partner. He's That's where I started. And like I said, I've bought 15 copies of his Modernist Cooking Made It Easy book um, because it I literally don't think there's a better place to get started with sous vide than that book. I, I mean, I really honestly don't. Um, I, I appreciate that. And and if you're a chef and you're interested in really like from start to finish understanding the sous vide process and want to implement it in your kitchen, or if you manage restaurants and want to figure it out, uh, Crea does have a three day sous vide cooking class. Um, cooking class is the wrong term. It's sous vide just everything class. I took it last year and it's takes you through a lot of the science behind it, as well as how you can use it in your restaurants and the safety considerations and how to put it as part of your cooking flow. And it's a really comprehensive and expensive, but if you are looking to implement sous vide in your restaurant long-term, like that's a great, great thing that you can go do for three days and come away knowing more about sous vide than most of the other cooks out there. They also do a, a three-day HACCP course, which I think is one of the barriers that really keeps people from, um, keeps, you know, chefs from bringing this into the restaurant. They work with health departments all over the place. So they're available for consulting. Um, and, and their chief scientist is Dr. Bruno Gusso, who invented the method, you know. So um, it, it, you can't learn from, from better people. That's yeah, the HACCP sure. plan is so, it's so hard because a lot of departments is- departments of health. I mean, like where I was working in Maryland, Frederick County is a little more advanced. Like we have Volt downtown. So that's maybe more common, but I was working in Carroll County and like, I don't think anyone was doing it, you know, and we had a vac machine and all this and they come in and they've literally never seen it. And it's like, what's the starting point? Because it's new to them and they instantly want to say like, shut it down, don't use it, you know, and it's, it's a lot of legwork to get that approved. And that's why there's a lot of secretive use of these things. I mean, I'm not calling anyone out, but I, we all know people who have like vac machines and circulators that are kind of like hidden and they take them out mm-hmm. to do their thing when nobody's going to catch them. The same with like yeah. the charcuterie in the closet, you know? Yeah. It's, uh, it, I mean, <laughs> we did a food conference in Delaware trying to sous vide 300 pounds of, of beef and, we went through some of the same stuff and it, it, it ended up working out, but yeah, it's, it's just, it's new. It, well, it's not new, but it's new to them. It's something that they don't know a lot about. So, um, you know, there's a lot of resources like that that are helpful. Have you guys had any notable fails, like something that you really thought you could do sous vide that at the end of the day was not worth doing, but you know, you just wanted to try. The biggest fails that I normally have are because I do a lot of testing of circulators and I'll use some of the inexpensive ones. And so I I experimented accidentally by seeing what happens if you cook a tri-tip at uh, boiling temperature for about half an hour because the the thermometer in the circulator went haywire and it just was boiling the water. Um, uh, it is not good, as you might imagine. Yeah. Uh, that's the sure. majority of the fails that I've had. Let's see. Um, I was trying to do a, a duck Benedict because I have a farm that, that does duck eggs. Duck eggs don't cook exactly the same as chicken eggs, I realized <laughs> very, very quickly. So, um, you know, that took me a little bit. I think my most disappointing result, honestly, and this sounds hilarious, and, and I'm going to say another Benedict, unfortunately, but I had this alpaca shank that I was like so excited to cook alpaca for the first time. And I'm like, oh, it's a shank. It's like lamb, you know, 24 hours. This will work out really well. And it was like shoe leather. It was so tough that, you know, it. I was so disappointed that morning that I didn't get to have my nice alpaca Benedict. Sure, there's not a lot of resources for cooking <laughs> alpaca. Where do you even get alpaca? I mean, it, is it like a special order through Cisco kind of thing? No, there's a, there's a, there's a couple. There, there's a few places, um, but... Uh, there's, I got that one, I think at fossil farms, uh, in New Jersey, um, stakes and game in Texas is another one. I just saw, that's another person I like watching justice Stewart uh, with gourmet deconstructed. He does a lot of, I was going to say justice is great. <laughs> he, he does a lot of fun. Like he's done everything from Sichuan jellyfish to 
you know, deep fried Python nuggets and, and all sorts Most of things. camel short ribs he did. Yeah. And you know, he posts back. these amazing camel short ribs and then I can't buy camel short ribs anywhere. Like the, yeah. the supplier that he used doesn't, uh, have them anymore so I'm I've, just, I've gotten camel before and cooked it but it was just ground uh, yeah I, I, short ribs that i wouldn't even think of camel having short ribs but i guess yeah there's a uh, i have some camel burger patties in my freezer actually to try but he did some antelope ribs a couple weeks ago that i i instantly was like i am so making those bottom from steak and steaks and game and i'm just waiting for figs to come in because i want to do a fig barbecue sauce on them but I just see weird things sometimes, like people talk about like making a cake sous vide. And I'm, I'm just kind of like, what are you doing? Like, just put your cake batter in a pan and throw it in the oven. Like, I don't feel like you need to try to do everything sous vide. I don't see any benefit to do that. It's like 25 minutes in the oven. What are you doing? Yeah, there's definitely some things I, especially in my group, I always encourage everyone to explore the method because that's my Facebook group is exploring sous vide. So it's all about seeing what sous vide can do. And there's a lot that you can do with it, but like most things, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to do it yeah. every single time. I think it's good to try stuff, but it's, you know, like I like scallops sous vide sometimes and it might change the texture a little bit and make it a little bit easier. But like I had scallops last night and I just pan fried them because they were just going to be just as fast to do that because I didn't have my circulator set up. So it's, you know, there's some things like that, that I think can give you convenience and some people really like using sous vide for it. And my answer to that's great, then use it. And there's other people that don't. And my answer is great. Don't use it then. Yeah. Uh, but there are things like I use my sous vide machine to make oatmeal all the time. And it's like, interesting. Yeah, why, oatmeal. why is that? Is it uh, because you get a better texture or is it a convenience that you can do like a bigger batch? It's because every single time I do it on the stove, I don't pay attention and it boils over on the stove. <laughs> and with the sous vide, it never boils over. I don't know if it tastes any better, you know, but it's, I am not cleaning up my stove every time I do it. So I use sous vide for it. And it's, some people would say it's stupid, but like that's the reasoning behind it is makes sense. And that's why I use it. So it's, there's some things like that, that I think personal preference can come into Come, come into play makes me yeah. think about grits because i do a lot of grits you know like you'll do a shrimp and grits for like 15 people and that's the same thing it's like if it's in a pot and you have that much you're gonna burn you have to store all the yeah. time the same with doing like a polenta like it maybe it's a better idea to just throw it in the circulator and not worry about it because you're not going to get that contact burning you can remove a lot of that variability too that you know no matter unless you have like a control freak or something, your stove is never the exact same temperature. The evaporation is going to happen differently depending on the humidity. And like, yeah, it's part of being a, a chef, right? Is knowing that and watching it and using sight and sound. But if you're doing something that you don't want to have to pay attention to, then it's going to be in like a sealed mason jar, you know, or a sealed bag that there's no evaporation. You know exactly how much water, how much salt, how much a grain that you need to put in it and you're going to get a consistent result every time, which there's yeah. definitely value to that. Cheesecake's another one like that, that I do cheesecakes all the time in, in the little Mason jars and they don't crack, they don't dry out. They're phenomenal. Um, and you know, it, any of those kind of custardy desserts work really, really well. I would never think of doing a cheesecake in there. Oh, it's so are you doing so... many, like many individuals? In yeah, it's like jars? the four ounce mason jars. I mean, you know, I, I've definitely toyed with the idea of doing an eight ounce mason jar because, you know, why not? <laughs> but um, it's fun. Like I've mixed in, uh, you know, I'll make the, the cheesecake batter and, you know, just a little graham cracker crust. And I've mixed in Oreos inside it or done an Oreo crust. I've mixed in chopped banana, just dropped it in with the batter um, and made a little banana cream. I mean, the the possibilities are endless. And it's so just light and creamy and, and phenomenal. One thing that a lot of people forget is that at its most basic, sous vide is just maintaining a specific temperature over time. And there's a lot of things like cheesecake and like making a hollandaise sauce, tempering chocolate, yogurt, that you're holding something at a set temperature. And we do a lot of things with, you know, double boilers and, you know, putting, you know, in a pan in a pan with water in it in the oven to kind of maintain the temperature that we were trying to like kind of trick it and you can use sous vide to accomplish a lot of those things because that's what it's designed for and yeah. you might need to finish it in a different way or you know do something at the end but if you're holding something in your kitchen and you're like 
every time I do this, I'm holding it at a specific temperature. That's something that is a good candidate to kind of explore with sous vide to see if it can accomplish that in a much easier you know, manner for you. Yeah, I do a lot of individual cheesecakes and a lot of uh, creme brulees. So yes. probably good, good thing to check out. I've never actually done either of those sous vide. So well, this has been great. Thanks so much for coming on the show, guys. I loved having you. I hope you enjoyed coming on, talking about sous vide and your conference and everything. I really appreciate you having us come on. This was great. And it's always fun chatting with you. You're so knowledgeable and you know, you're passionate about cooking. And it, I'll always really enjoy our conversations. Absolutely. Yeah, I love sharing culinary knowledge and you guys do too. I mean, people always ask me like, could I get the recipe for this? And when I say I'm going to share, people are so surprised because I think they think all chefs have like secret recipes. And what's the point of that? Like, I don't see not sharing what I know with everyone. So yeah. even if you're a customer, I mean, you're not going to not hire me to do a dinner for you because you now have my recipe. It's not about that. It's about the convenience of not having to do the work. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and so I always, yeah. Yeah, I always want to share. So I'm hoping that I have a lot of non-professional people listen to this podcast and um, can point them in your direction. <laughs> well, we appreciate that. Absolutely. So to all our listeners, this was the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast. As always, you can find us at chefswithoutrestaurants.com and .org and on all social media platforms. Thanks and have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast. And if you're interested in being a guest on the show or sponsoring a show, please let us know. We can be reached at chefswithoutrestaurants at gmail.com. Thanks so much.